OK. Thank you. How many of you came back and thought, hey, it's time to do some quantum physics? <laughs> so I'm going to talk about a moonshot. So most people want to talk about what can I do now, and what is useful today, and how can I make money? And I thought it was like so boring. It's like, you know, been there, done that. So what can I do that is completely improbable today, that has no chance of being useful anytime soon? <laughs> right? In the old Indian days, we used to call it Brahminical research, which means that it is not only not useful, it can never be useful. <laughs> That's very important to be a Brahmin. That is, you cannot ever, ever, even accidentally, unwittingly, do anything to anybody that could be useful. It's just, it's just wrong. Uh, you know, that's like, you know, you're like dropping, you're like beneath yourself to be doing things like that. Okay? So I thought, hey, why don't I do that? Right? Let, me, let, me, let me aspire to that level of uselessness. Right? And then uh, and I thought quantum computing seemed like a good opportunity for that. So, okay? so anybody who came here thinking, my god, I learned something, I'll immediately become rich and useful, no. Okay? I will go through two semesters of MIT uh, quantum physics and 10 Nobel Prize winners in about four minutes, OK? <laughs> so the story begins like this. There was a guy called James Clark Maxwell, who was considered a great physicist in the uh, you know, 1860s, 1870s, and stuff like that, the heir to Isaac Newton, right? And he was quite convinced of two things, that light was a wave and there was ether, OK? And it turned out that uh, he was wrong on both. Okay, and the problem began because people started using wave theory to study something called black body radiation, and it was called the ultraviolet catastrophe. And then a guy by the name of Max Planck said, you know, if I make two assumptions, one that things are not a wave but they're a particle, at least temporarily, and instead of doing integration because that's continuous variable, I have to do summation, uh, which is a summation of discrete. Let me see if we can match the black body radiation. So with great apologies to the Department of Physics around him, he said, uh, this is only temporary. Please don't throw me out. I'm going to just, just, just for a few moments assume that you know, E is equal to H times nu, which is some kind of a discreteness. And I'm going to replace integration with summation and see if I can match the black body radiation curve. To his shock, it matched perfectly. So apparently, he was walking back home with his son. He was already in his 40s. And he told his son, I believe, son, I'm going to be more famous than Newton by tomorrow morning. And he was right, because uh, pretty much. But the community of physics said, that's nonsense. How, you know, what, what, you're just making this up. right? It just works. It's a fit. It makes no sense. Fortunately for him, there's a guy called Einstein who looked at it and said, there's another mystery that's going on. It's called photoelectric effect. When you add waves into uh, some metal, and you see how electrons fly out, it turns out it doesn't depend on the amplitude of the wave, which is what they thought was important, but actually the frequency. And the way you could make electromagnetism work is to say, let me take what this guy called Max Planck did and see if that works. And it works perfectly. So what legitimized Planck was actually Einstein. And then as soon as Einstein wrote his paper, Planck got his Nobel Prize, and then next year Einstein got his Nobel Prize. And so people said, oh my god, light we thought was wave, it could actually be a particle. But they thought light was some vague, weird thing, and they said, yeah, light is light, you know, forget about it. Then a bunch of different guys were playing along with something called electrons. They were quite sure electrons was a particle. You know, the electrons are coming out. Then some other physicists thought, let me shoot these electrons into a crystal uh, uh, structure and see how they pop off those crystal structures. You know, this is what professors do, right? sitting around shooting electrons into crystal structures. See, right? They are not trying to be useful, right? right? <laughs> These are the Brahminical guys sitting around saying, what happens if I change the angle of the electron and shoot at this crystal? Hey, let's see what happens. <laughs> to the shock, what did they see? They saw diffraction rings. And they said, oh my god, you mean electron is a wave? And that was the first aha in the 1910s, 1915s, 1920s, that everything is a particle, everything is a wave. And you suddenly start thinking, oh my god, were the Hindus right 5,000 years ago? You know, because we talk about these vague things. Nothing is there, everything is there. Everything is zero and infinity. You're inside, you're outside. You're there, you're not there. Uh, <laughs> right? And then you say, my god, what are you saying? And then you say, it looks like quantum physics, except you know, it's in Sanskrit poetry. 
right? So that is the center of pretty much all technology today, is quantum physics. You take your iPhone and there is a chip in there and you go deep, 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 deep in there, there'll be a transistor and the transistor is PNP junction, quantum physics. It's hard to believe that this is how it is, but it is how it is. So then people start thinking, what is the math behind this? And the math behind this works something like this. You forget everything you learned from Newton. You forget everything you learned from Maxwell. You say all nonsense. So those kids who never learned anything in school and college were perfect because it was all wrong. <laughs> right? Everything Newton said pretty much is wrong, actually. I mean, it's remarkable. So if you didn't go to class and got a D, you're already ahead of all those people who have to unlearn all the physics, right? Uh, you know, light travels in straight lines. No, 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 all wrong, right? Uh, and so the key math that works here is everything has a wave equation. Uh, you manipulate these wave equations. Uh, and when you're ready to uh, measure something, you square this uh, uh, wave equation because it has negative values. And you get a positive value. And you interpret that as the probability of finding something. So everything is probabilistic. So quantum mechanics is basically the mathematics of these you know, wave particle dualities. That's what it is. The key uh, idea here is uh, captured by a guy called uh, Schrodinger. And if you think of him, he was also a you know, young chap sitting around thinking, how can I make all the physics that I learned continue to work? Right? So he's a young professor thinking, I learned all of this. I got my PhD. I'm a professor. And everything I learned appears to be wrong. But can I salvage something? Can I salvage something? Right? And one thing you learn in, in uh, classical mechanics by Newton is called the Hamiltonian. Okay, you solve these equations using the Hamiltonian. So, and so Schrodinger said, what if I maintain everything I learned by keeping the Hamiltonian, except instead of calling something momentum, I will replace it by something which is I derivative dou by dou x, and something called energy by I dou by dou t, you know, like a partial derivative. And retrofit it back, retrofit this baby back into Hamiltonian. It turns out it's a particularly accurate answer. He got his Nobel Prize for simply retrofitting a couple of derivatives back into Hamiltonian stuff. And that is the essence of most of quantum physics without relativity. So what is called basic quantum mechanics is Schrodinger's equation working on these wave equations. Okay? That's what it is. So that's a whole bunch of physics, bunch of Nobel Prize winners right there. Okay? Extremely smart guy by the name of Richard Feynman. Okay, you heard of Richard Feynman, right? So uh, he has done incredible work, quantum electrodynamics and so on. And in 1981, he was asked to give a keynote, and he said, what shall I talk about? And they said, talk about something that nobody will talk about. He said, OK, that's good. And he talked about something called quantum computing. So the first introduction of quantum computing came from Richard Feynman, who said, what if we could harness this craziness? Can we actually use this thing for computing? In particular, can we use this to understand physics itself? Because until then, they were doing physics on classical machines. And they were thinking, my god, I can never solve these energy equations. Okay, So quantum computing uh, was uh, initiated, let's say, at least from a, a purely uh, just throw it in, throwing it out there kind of a thing by, uh, by Feynman. But fortunately, there were a lot of professors around the world with nothing to do. And they said, you know, <laughs> what if we take this seriously? What if we start studying, if there was a quantum computer, how would the algorithms look like? And then you got Peter Shore, who said, oh, I can factor prime numbers so much faster. So as Brian mentioned cryptography, Shore's algorithm basically factors uh, you know, prime numbers in uh, su you know, super uh, speed, which means that everything that we know in cryptography will have to be replaced if a quantum computer becomes you know, kind of real. Okay? And so for the last 30 years or so, professors at MIT, at Caltech, how many of you see a Big Bang Theory TV show? So those are the people. Okay? Th those are the types of people. There's a Sheldon Cooper running around, right? I mean, you don't expect Sheldon Cooper you know, to be the CEO of Microsoft, right? But uh, you expect Sheldon Cooper to potentially figure out how to work quantum uh, computing. So th those are the kinds of people. What happened recently is university space research uh, uh, association, which is a, a group of universities, NASA and Google decided to buy a quantum computer made by D-Wave, 
and said, uh, uh, professors around the world, uh, if you have interesting ideas of uh, quantum computing, we'll give you 100 hours of quantum computing for free. So this machine costs about $50 million. Uh, it's made by D-Wave. Uh, and it's a quantum computer in the sense that it holds something called qubits in superposed uh, position. And if you give it a problem, it does quantum mechanics in it and spits the answer out. So I said, OK, let me write a proposal. So I said, I'm a business school professor. I'm interested in solving hard integer optimization problems that classical computers are unable to do. I would like to cook up quantum algorithms for integer programs. Uh, can you give me uh, the D-Wave machine? And I wrote this proposal around Thanksgiving last year. And January 3rd, I got an email saying, congratulations, professor. Here's your quantum computer. OK, so what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to build the first quantum software company. Right, so you don't see this. This is what I want. I want to take an integer programming problem that you might remember, convert the optimization problem into a Hamiltonian structure. So I'm going to go from operations research to theoretical physics, step one. I'm going to then take that Hamiltonian, prepare it so that a quantum computer can understand it. Let the quantum computer solve it. I'm going to snap the answer back and give it back as the answer. So that's kind of where, where this is going. So I'm basically moving out of uh, what is discrete math into the world of quantum physics. And then how you represent a problem in D-Wave is to convert that into a graph embedding problem. So many of you have taken Ravi's class and graph theory classes and so on and so forth. So you go from discrete math into quantum physics, and then you take quantum physics through graph into the, the quantum computer. And then you basically sample answers, and then uh, you throw the answer back out. And the claim is it's a much faster way of solving problems than ever before. Will it work? I don't know. <laughs> As a business school professor and entrepreneur, I hope so. As a Brahmin, I hope not. OK? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>